All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And this is BXGS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast, episode number 20. We've come quite a long way. And uh, well, I mean, it's uh, end of July. So as usual, there's not that much happening right now. But uh, we got some good news and some uh, pretty awesome stuff coming up um, today. And there is also a few releases and some pretty neat libraries and demos. So I guess um, let's get started, shall we? So let's start with the news as usual. The first thing we got today is the future of WebAssembly. A look at upcoming features and proposals. The um, interesting thing is like WebAssembly has been out for quite some time, right? And I, for example, didn't know, like I knew that there was a WebAssembly spec, obviously, but I didn't know that there is the more or less the same process involved in um, sort of staging and discussing the features as it works with ECMAScript, right? So the article here outlines the process and talks about the current WebAssembly proposals that you can find um, in different phases, you know, including phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, which I assume is more or less the same as with the ECMAScript process, but um, you know, we're gonna see. There are some really awesome features coming to WebAssembly, including garbage collection, uh, fixed with sims, threads, and all that kind of stuff. So if you are interested in WebAssembly and interested in the way it is going to develop, uh, you can have a look at this article. It goes not just, you know, listing the uh, discussed proposals, but also goes into more in-depth look into each proposal and what actually brings to the table and how exactly it works and so on and so forth. So it's actually pretty detailed. So if you are interested in WebAssembly, do give it a read. It is quite good and will keep you up to speed. I also need to find a way now to track those proposals better because I personally absolutely like the idea of WebAssembly and uh, making web faster using it. Not just web, but you know, JavaScript world basically. All right, next article we got is building the Google Photos web UI, a peek under the hood. Article from the uh, Google team that worked on the Google Photos uh, progressive web app. Uh, and it is a very detailed one. As you can see here, it's quite long. And it talks about a lot of things starting from, you know, how they managed to keep the app small, how they managed to uh, make the photos look like they, you know, load nearly instantly, 60 FPS scrolling, justified layout, and all of that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of very interesting in-depth insights into that, uh, including the, what I found like really cool, they discussed the techniques for uh, making the photo load look very fast, basically when it's, it's really like, I, I, it always fascinates me how all those um, sort of loading techniques are always about cheating the user into thinking that it's actually fast, when in reality, that is really slow. So there's the example of loading over here. And uh, the preview of it, how it actually works is here, they use the CSS blur style filter on the smaller image to stretch it, and then essentially load the high res uh, image and replace it, right, which actually looks very nice. So when you look at in motion, it looks quite amazing. But you know, when you know how it works, it's like, okay, this is cheating. <laughs> But yeah, really cool article. So if you're interested in progressive web apps and all sort of things related to building really large progressive web apps uh, from Google guys, then it's a really, really good article. There's, there is a video here, which I haven't watched yet, but uh, I am planning to go through that at some point because it's probably something good as well. So I, I only read the article itself. But yeah, there you go. Google uh, Photos Web UI in-depth look. Next thing we got is reversing JavaScript malware from marveloptics.com. This is, um, I mean, I wouldn't call it in depth, but more or less quite high level look at how to reverse a JavaScript malware that is injected into the website, which is a quite common thing that happens, especially to like um, WordPress websites. So something we had happen in our research group quite often with uh, the web, uh, WordPress websites that we have, especially for the project ones that, you know, are no longer updated and have like some outdated versions of WordPress uh, that have uh, some vulnerabilities and they are very frequently get hacked. And most uh, frequently, all that is done is that some JavaScript files are injected. And you know, you don't really see that anything malicious happens until you actually go to the website. So this article talks about how you approach the reversing of those files and figuring out what exactly they do, right? So how do you start with um, deobfuscation? 
how do you figure out what does it do? How do you find the entry point? How do you identify where it actually sends the stuff and so on and so forth, right? So if you were interested in um, sort of reverse engineering the uh, obfuscated JavaScript code, then this is a pretty good uh, place to start, specifically talking about malware and uh, data requests because I mean, this is typically what it does, right? So uh, including yeah, the who is uh, with uh, figuring out who's actually registered that obviously it's like 90% of time it's something from China. I don't know why is that a thing probably because they don't care too much about the security. I don't know, maybe it's like easy to uh, evade the law there. I'm not sure why is it like this. But um, hey, yeah, majority of those uh, malware scripts are knocking into China websites. So don't know what's the reason behind this. If you do do let me know in the chat or in the comments. Right, next thing we got is the best explanation of JavaScript reactivity, essentially a look at the observer pattern in JavaScript and specifically um, uh, in the example of Vue.js, right? So how does Vue actually tracks the data within the component or the view app, how it actually reacts to it and so on and so forth. So if you I mean, essentially under the um, all description and everything is in your typical observer pattern that is used everywhere, right? So if you were interested in that, if you still don't understand the reactivity, then do have a look, it does give a pretty good explanation. Uh, starting with a very basic solution that basically explains how to do it yourself in a very simple way and going down to um, pretty complex uh, you know, explanation of what what is done in view to address various issues that pop up over, you know, doing the simple thing, right? So you got this watcher thing, the observer, essentially, and then uh, all the other things that like property changes and stuff like this, right? And uh, yeah. So if you're interested in observer pattern, and specifically the I guess, underlying inerts of Vue.js, then this would be a good starting point to uh, learn about them. Right, next thing we got is how to build an NPM worm. Uh, this is essentially, um, again, a reverse engineering of the ESLint scope worm that I've talked about in the last podcast that was, you know, quite a big thing and NPM fixed it quite quick before a lot of people could have been uh, infected but this article goes into look how exactly it worked why it was detected which by the way is because of a javascript error so <laughs> the code that was written that was the worm itself it was erroneous right so they 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 written this whole like try catch thing with a lot of error catching and everything they still screwed up because they didn't caught one of the errors that happens and it error just started spitting out on installs and people was like what well, what is that so it is kind of silly when you think about it, but um, yeah, there you go, JavaScript. <laughs> so it is pretty interesting to read basically the, the whole like thought process of how, how you can build a worm like this, how would it act, uh, what would it do, what kind of consequences can it have It would if it would go unnoticed and so on and so forth. There's a really good um, thought piece basically about the whole uh, problem and how to mitigate it as well, right? Um, we are going to talk about mitigation a bit later on, uh, because NPM did introduce a new thing uh, for in, in terms of like two factor authentication that is well, we're going to talk about it a bit later. Right, next thing we got is using react in cycle JS and vice versa. So this is an article from Mr. Andre uh, Stultz, or I'm not sure if it's Stultz or like, okay, I'm not I'm not gonna even try to pronounce it correctly. Let's just assume it's Andre Stultz. If you know, please tell me that's not correct. So he's an author of CycleJS framework, which is um, RxJS based UI framework, uh, purely centered around the observables, which is pretty neat, but you know, I never kind of got to use it in a real project because I just found it to be, um, how to put it, overly, um, over the use case specific, let's put it this way. So I never needed as much reactivity in my project as it offers, right? So, but, um, it's been out there for quite some time, right? It's a pretty neat project. If you didn't uh, hear, if you haven't heard about it, if you haven't tried it, do give it a look. It's really cool and it offers some really nice tractions. And um, if you have a very reactive app, using it can save you a lot of pain, right? Um, 
The thing is, they had their own rendering system, essentially. And now they are introducing um, react package that allows you to use cycle with react react Dom and react native, which seems to be working pretty well. And basically, essentially, you know, it's instead of having the uh, constructing the elements using the uh, cycle methods, like this is what the cycle methods look like. I mean, it's essentially the same as JSX, just, you know, their own function, which uh, you can use JSX with cycle too. But in this case, they just map it to react, it seems. And you can also, you know, use uh, JSX if you would like to. Here's an example. So if you are interested in a very reactive and observable based um, view, or I guess framework in this case already, because it's not just like, Data man it, like it provides you the full stack, right? There's, there's like data management, there's the rendering, there's everything you need basically to build an app. So I guess it's a framework. If you're interested in a um, observable based framework, then have a look at the cycle. Maybe you want to use it with the React um, because this seems to be pretty nice, actually. Very nice API and uh, very straightforward to use. Okay, continuing, we got Ask HN, were you happy about uh, moving your API from REST to GraphQL? I am not going to go through all the answers because as you can see here, there is quite a discussion here. But if you are interested in comparing REST and GraphQL, and if you are figuring out if you want to move from GraphQL from REST to GraphQL, or if you want, if it's worth investing into GraphQL, I would highly suggest you read, if not all, then at least top comments in this thread, because there are some really, really good insights from people, you know, just the um, starting from just the opinions being, you know, I don't really like GraphQL, or I don't see its value, to people who are really invested into GraphQL a lot, and say either that it worked out very well for them, or it didn't work out at all. And they actually had more problems with using GraphQL than using REST API. So as you know, as, as I already said more than once, I think GraphQL is a very niche technology. And if your use case doesn't fit it, then REST API would be a better chosen like 99% of time. But uh, yeah, basically, if you're evaluating REST versus GraphQL, have a look at this thread, there's a really, really good comments here. And you will probably find a lot of new things that you uh, did know, because yeah, I also found some things that were like very interesting insights, basically. All right, continuing, we got operational, no, pff, let me, try, let me try that again. Operationalizing Node.js for server side rendering. This is um, article from Airbnb engineering and data science team. And it talks about um, essentially optimizing the server side rendering side of the Airbnb website, because they are now heavily invested into the server side rendering. And this is sort of their primary place where the rendering actually happens, right? And most of the pages already serve pre rendered. And uh, the article looks into how to optimize it, how to operate op op that word is not easy. <laughs> Operationalize it is what I want to say. And what kind of problems they encountered during doing um, while doing that, what kind of things they had to change the solutions to that. Yeah, the hypernova framework that they've um, created and what kind of lessons did they learn while doing that. And there's like there is a lot of insights, as you can see here, the article is pretty long, It's quite heavy on the technical details and conceptual insights. So if you are doing server side rendering, then I would highly recommend you reading this. Uh, if not, and you are interested in absolutely as well. If you never did any server side rendering, then it might not be a good starting point, because it does looks at the very, uh, you know, in depth details of it. So that might not be very uh, good starting point. But uh, nonetheless, it's really, really interesting article to read. Right, next thing we got is building a real time serverless GraphQL API with web sockets on AWS. Um, this is a tutorial, right, on how to use Amazon Web Services. Uh, I think they use Lambda, I believe. Yes, it is Lambda and uh, GraphQL. Although in this case, it's not the Amazon Web Services GraphQL as a service that they provide, but actually uh, the App Sync service. Uh, and yeah, essentially it just goes through the whole um, setting up from scratch, you know, how to create a project, how to create the queries, the bindings, the data schema, and all and so on and so forth, and how to deploy it on AWS. So if you're interested in that, if you think that this is something you're going to be doing, do have a look, it is a decent one, again, this used so it's not uh, traditional GraphQL, let's put it this way, it uses WebSockets. 
I'm not sure why, well, like what kind of cases would require that, but you know, if that's something that you need in your app, then have a look. That's probably uh, something useful for you. All right, next thing we got is deploying applications with confidence using Kubernetes. Um, article talking about a very, like it's not a very big article. I just thought I highlighted because first of all, it talks about uh, Node.js specifically. Second of all, it gives a very good high level overview of Kubernetes, right? So how do you learn it? How do you run it? How do you containerize the Node.js apps for Kubernetes? How do you handle the lifecycle events? What are the pods? Uh, how do you package the apps and so on and so forth. So there's like the Kubernetes is a pretty complex thing, right? There's a lot of concepts and a lot of tools that are, so it's not just one thing. There's actually a whole ecosystem around it and you have to understand a lot of things. And um, this article gives you a very high level overview of all of those things with a URL, like with the links to the related uh, pages, articles, tutorials, whatever, they basically can get you up to speed, at least with a basic understanding of how it works. So if you never worked with Kubernetes, that will be a good starting point. Uh, if you know a bit about it, that might be a good uh, learning resource as well. Maybe there's some things that you haven't seen here yet. So um, yes, if you're interested in Kubernetes, do we have a look? This is a pretty good article. All right, next thing we got is compiler in JavaScript using Antler. So this is, um, I wouldn't call it a tutorial, it's more of a sort of a walkthrough on how to create a compiler from JavaScript into Python, I believe, uh, using the Antler, um, um, man, how I would, Antler tool, I guess, or um, Antler grammar, maybe. maybe that's probably the best way to explain it. So the Antler is this another tool for language recognition. It's actually Java based, but it is very, very flexible. And you can do just about anything you want with it. And um, this article specifically talks about using Antler to take the JavaScript codes and compile it into Python. There are also code examples here. And I think there's a link to the GitHub somewhere at some point. And uh, yeah, it walks you through the whole process of essentially, you know, setting up the grammar for the language, parsing it correctly, tweaking it, compiling it and figuring out how exactly, you know, it's gonna end up when you compile it to the target. So um, if you are interested in creating your own JavaScript to something or parsing maybe JavaScript in um, not in an abstract syntax tree way, because this is actually way more complex, let's put it this way, uh, then have a look at this article. It does give you a very good introduction. That, there was an image somewhere that was showing that they could, yeah, there you go. So JavaScript, C sharp, PHP into Python. I believe they are also compiling it into Python. Right. So yeah, if you're interested in um, parsing programming languages, uh, not just with abstract syntax trees, but with um, language parsing toolkits, then do have a look at this one. This is pretty good. Okay, next thing we got is JavaScript fundamentals before learning React JS. I wouldn't call it before learning. Uh, it's more of a um, let's talk about JavaScript fundamentals used in React because the article goes into outlining what kind of things you will be using alongside React, like, you know, React uh, or JavaScript classes. How do you use the shorthand functions to do like bindings and arrow functions and component syntax and map reduce and filter in rendering and all that kind of stuff. All of that is talked about within the React context, right? So there's like, there's nothing really new about ternary operator, but if you use it in React, then it can work, like it will be handled slightly differently, right? So it's it's a good intro essentially to uh, applying the JavaScript functions within React if you were having problems with it. <coughs> oh, apologies. All right, let us continue. Uh, next thing we got is tutorial, building an Instagram clone with Vue.js and CSS Gram. Um, this is, a tutorial, as you might imagine from the title, on how to build a very simple web app Instagram that um, I don't know, I probably blocked the embed. Let me just allow this real quick. Um, no, go away. Okay, there we go. And this is probably the app itself. Where, where's my, what happens? Where's my scripts? Oh, come on. Don't block everything, show me this stuff. 
No? Still no? No, it shouldn't be Google Tag Manager, right? Okay, whatever. It doesn't want to load, so... But basically, that's the images showing how you actually create the uh, Instagram using the... Uh, as a progressive web app, basically, right? And uh, for applying filters, they use the CSS gram, which is a pretty neat CSS uh, set of CSS filters that allows you to change the way the photos look. And it's built in Vue.js with the you know, header, footer, and phone-oriented layout, essentially. Uh, so if you were interested in how to actually do that, then um, have a look. That's pretty nice tutorial, I guess. Uh, it is in Vue.js, so it's going to be very Vue-heavy and Vue-specific with all the Vue uh, template syntax and stuff like this. But it does give you an idea of how you can make your own uh, Instagram clone with uh, CSS uh, filters, right? And uh, I mean, if you've never seen CSS filters, just have a look at them. You can do some pretty cool stuff with, with it. And uh, I mean, I, like they are maybe not as close as the native filters. At least, you know, you cannot really tweak them as much as they, for example, Instagram allows you to, but it is getting there, right? So you can already do some pretty impressive things with them. Right, next thing we got is 15 HTML element methods you've potentially never heard of. Uh, so this talks about the specific HTML elements. So whenever you do get element by whatever, so you get the HTML element uh, subclasses like HTML table element or DOM element, whatever. And it talks about the methods that they have that are quite obscure, unknown, maybe, you know, never used, rarely used. There are some that I never, like I didn't know about, like the table methods, for example, I didn't know the table has this create T head insert row. Um, like this is pretty cool. Like, you know, you can literally construct a table uh, using additional methods, not just like with manually with hands, which is way more annoying. Scroll interview is something I knew about and I used quite a lot. Hidden is as well uh, pretty popular, I think. Toggle class is also uh, quite popular. Query selector is something that is also, you know, bridged lots like, hey, you don't need jQuery, you can just use this. And if you didn't know, you can apply it on the any element and it will search for descendants. Uh, but yeah, you know, if you are working with DOM from plain JavaScript, that it is a good article to have a look at because you will find quite a lot of uh, methods that you might not have known about and that can be very useful to you. So do have a look. All right, next thing we got is build an Excel add-in using Vue. Um, you remember that some time ago, Microsoft announced that you will be able to build an Office add-ons using JavaScript. And uh, well, that's the one of the first documentation that's actually also use Angular, React, and jQuery. So it's not just Vue. Uh, but yes, you can now build an Excel add-in using JavaScript and Vue.js. And there's like, this is a tutorial essentially, and there's an example of how that would look. And uh, it looks pretty amazing, to be honest. It's like, you can do quite a lot of things with it. So if you are interested in extending uh, Microsoft Office using JavaScript, then this is probably a good place to start. Right, next thing we got is Reddit voting UI in vanilla versus React versus Vue versus HyperApp, shedding light on the purpose of single page app frameworks. Um, really neat article it basically goes to build this tiny ui that you can see over here so it's uh, if you've never you know been on reddit it's essentially you have the rating of the post which starts from zero and then if you upvote it's going to go plus one if you downvote it's going to go minus one right it's really simple ui so the author first builds it using vanilla js with like simple html and then goes okay here we're gonna take the buttons add event listeners and you know get some sort of a score and then do the state changing and so on and so forth. And then, you know, it gets more complicated because if you press downward, you should not be uh, longer be able to press it again and so on and so forth. So it's like, it gets a bit more complex. And then you um, finish it. And after that, the author looks at how you do the exactly the same thing with React View and HyperApp and what kind of advantages and disadvantages those have. And, you know, where it's going to be easier, where it's going to be harder, what kind of challenges are going to pop up when you are doing this in the frameworks. And it is a very interesting comparison. So, you know, if you're still struggling to understand why you would need something like React View or Hyper or any other UI framework, then uh, have a look at this article. It will probably give you a very good 
example on why it is way easier to build something like this with um, a framework rather than doing it all yourself. All right, next thing we got is how fast can you learn React? Um, essentially an experience piece from an author who uh, tried learning React and, you know, read all those articles that say, hey, you can learn React in five minutes, in seven minutes, in eight minutes, in one hour, in afternoon or whatever. And uh, he goes to start it. This is the biggest bullshit that has ever been said about React. Well, just to give you an impression, you know, it's never easy to learn new technology, especially when it's different from everything else, right? So I was learning React when it just came out after using Angular for a few years. And I think it took me a good two months to figure everything out. It was hard, like it wasn't easy to understand, but once it's clicked for me, it was just amazingly easy to use it. That's, that's what I say. And no, I don't believe that you can learn it in five minutes. I don't believe you can learn it in seven minutes or even in, in an evening, unless you have a huge background and a you know, very good understanding of the whole underlying principles of the things that React uses, which you probably don't, let's be honest. There's not that many people who have that kind of experience. So yeah, it's, it's um, quite amusing to read. It's a very well written article. There are some points that I don't really agree with. So like the setup point where you know you, the author, I mean, I guess it's, you can say it's an over exaggeration. So it's like install node, get the editor, install yarn, install, run create react app, and then run start. In reality, you can, as we well know, you can, holy crap, those motorbike riders. Um, in reality, we know that you can actually use react without installing anything. You just open up the editor and, you know, add the React DOM file and start writing it without JSX, right? That works. You don't really need any setup, but obviously that's not very well described in the docs and that's not the way you want to write it. You actually want the compilation. And uh, yeah, there is like a lot of good points here and a lot of points that I don't really completely agree with, but anyway, it's interesting to read someone else's experience on learning React. So, you know, if you're either considering it or already learning it right now, do have a look. There are some really good points and it is amusing to read. So let's be honest. Um, uh, do have a look. It is at least, you know, going to be entertaining. Right. Next thing we got is, yes, this is the NPM thing that I've been talking about in the beginning. This is essentially the response for the uh, ESLint scope package compromisation, the worm that they had there. You are now able to enable two-factor authentication uh, protection for specific packages. So if you didn't know before, NPM allowed you to enable two-factor OOTH either for uh, just logging in or for writing. So on every write, you would be asked for the uh, OTP. That was annoying. Uh, like the fact that they added um, just for logging in is good enough for me. But I understand that, you know, in cases when you have a really popular large packages that have more than one uh, collaborator working on them, you actually do want to protect it in a way that uh, is more reliable than, you know, just having a token that can be stolen and then anyone else can publish that uh, update to that package. And this is what happened with um, ESLint scope, right? So they introduced this to factor authentication for packages. You can now say, okay, npmc access to fa required and then a package name which means that this package package on publish would require an otp to be entered and if you cannot enter it they will throw and say okay bye bye which is great but um yeah we i mean we're going to see how that develops this is not the only solution to to it as we discussed before and i'm still waiting for code signing to be added to npm but we're going to see how that develops right next thing we got is the uh, this is actually a new proposal for HTML, would you believe or not, uh, called portals. So the idea is that um, there, we, we have the iframe now, right? And you can embed another page as an iframe, but the iframe cannot be expanded, right? So here's an example uh, when you have the embedded thing and if you click on it, it actually replaces the current page, including the URL which I think is absolutely amazing because it opens a possibility of, you know, doing a pretty rich animations that would basically challenge the native apps. And um, the proposal itself is super simple. So we will get the portal tag in addition to uh, iframe, I guess. And you would have the activate method that would optionally get some data and 
uh, that would expand this portal to the whole or replace the portal uh, content, the current page with the portal content, right? Um, and uh, there's even some additional like discussion on alternatives considered and why they didn't work so well and the uh, VICG discussion on uh, promotable iframes. So I don't know about you, but to me that sounds really awesome because essentially we keep getting, um, this is the, um, well, how do you put it? This is essentially the alternative to screens and states and push states in the Android and iOS um, in, on the web, right? So we can actually get the full replaceable pages that can be embedded into the app painlessly and easy. And this is just like, at some point, I really, really think so. At some point, we'll just get a web apps that could replace native apps completely. Like we're slow, very slowly, but moving that way, right? We're sort of accelerating over time, but still it's kind of, you know, not, not quite there, but we're getting there. And I think it's absolutely amazing. I absolutely love this proposal and I'm gonna be keeping a close eye on this. All right, next thing we got is a tip that I personally didn't know and I think is quite amazing. Turns out you can access uh, values from package.json in Node.js using nvar. So I didn't know that. And you know, you can just say process.env.npm underscore package underscore, and then the key you want from package.json. So for example, you can say process and npm package version, and you're gonna get the version from package.json. So no longer need to require package.json, uh, which is pretty great. And um, I, I don't even know if that's documented because this is like really cool. Uh, just a small tip. All right, another tiny tip we got, come on Twitter, don't ban me, is uh, if you didn't know, so there's this unpackaged service, right? That uh, allows you to access NPM components uh, using the unpackaged um, uh, URL. So if you go uh, unpackage, right? And if you go, for example, view material, it will link you to the folder. So if, you, if I actually remove the slash, it will get me the file. And the cool thing is that you can say module, right? And what what this does is that actually takes the JavaScript and compiles it to ES module. So you can actually import that. And the neat trick is that when you're writing in CodePen or Code Sandbox or any other online editor, and you have a browser that supports dynamic imports, what you can do is you can say import unpackage module name question mark module. And then if you evade that, you will actually get that module. So here's an example, you can actually evade preact and then just use it to render something into the body like clock, right? So this is a really, really cool tip. And there's a also a quite hilarious um, discussion somewhere here. Someone was like, you should name it not NPM, but required to troll people, which I think would, yeah, would, would cause some amount of butt hurt. So, but anyway, it's a really, really cool tip. So if you didn't know about that, unpackage is pretty amazing. All right, next thing we got is uh, introducing themes to Code Sandbox. Um, I think Code Sandbox is one of my favorite uh, online sandboxes where you can play around with the code and you know specifically like React components and share something small. And uh, they introduce themes that are compatible to VS Code. So you can export your VS Code theme and just import it in Code Sandbox and use it there. And the cool thing is powered by WebAssembly, which is pretty neat and uh, seems to be very um, complex sort of an underlying engineering and I would want to see the more in-depth look into how exactly it works. So this is just the announcement itself. I don't know if it's open source, how it works. There we go. Um, doesn't seem like it's open source, but I would love to see, you know, the more long, like longer write up on uh, how the hell does it actually works. It seems like they use this Onigasm library, which is what the hell is that? Oniguruma, wait, someone built a regex library using WebAssembly. That's just, <laughs> I have to look at that at some point. All right, whatever, let's continue. All right, the next thing we got is the announcement from REPL IT guys. Uh, this is another online sandbox if you didn't know about it. They just announced that they're gonna be doing a universal package manager that is gonna be working for all the languages that they support. And uh, if you never heard about Replit, if you never worked with it, well, they actually support a lot of languages, like really a lot. This is, this is, this is not even all they have. There's like, you know, Ruby, PHP, Lua, Python, Kotlin, C-sharp, 
Rust, Swift, R, Bash. And all you have to do to use it, you just, you know, say, okay, create new one. And you say, I want a Golang, right? You just click on it and you get a Go environment right off the bat. Uh, right now, it works and you get like a shell. So you can actually say, go, I don't know, how's it called actually? Uh, oh, you just run it from here, okay. It's still a shell, but you know. Um, Right, so the thing is that uh, for the moment they have their own package manager that is kind of bootstrapped around each of the uh, languages. So like in Python, when you're on the package, they will be using the pip In JavaScript, they're going to be using npm and so on and so forth. But that's not obviously doesn't really scale and it's hard to manage. And then you have to write those specific um, package managers for each language, like, you know, the Ruby and like they have a lot of them. So they decided to build one universal package manager that would work across all the languages, which is, sounds crazy, but I don't know, like, <laughs> we're gonna see how that ends up. Um, the announcement itself sounds pretty exciting. They're starting just with the JavaScript, Python, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and web frameworks that they support, and gonna expand it to all the languages that they uh, have available in Repolit. So I am, um, it's basically a very raw announcement. There's not much info here besides that, hey, we're gonna do that thing. We're gonna see how that ends up, but it does sound very interesting and I really hope they will open source it. Um, but yeah, that's basically all I have to say. Uh, hey, Zemohavitz, welcome to the stream. All right, and the uh, last thing we got is not strictly JavaScript related, but I thought it was a really good article, so I would share it because I always see a lot of people having troubles uh, working with the shell. So this one is called the shell introduction I wish I had. Um, and if you are new to the shell and if you are just learning the shell or want to learn the shell, and in my opinion, the shell is like one of the most powerful and one of the most useful tools the developer can learn ever. And you should absolutely learn it, at least again, in my opinion. So if you are, only learning or want to learn, then this article will give you the basic understanding of everything you need to know about the shells. What are the shell? What are the shells out there? What is the shell? What does it do? What what kind of actions can you do with it? What are the package managers? What are the dot files? There's even a Vim introduction here. The aliases, the scripts that you can have, and so on and so forth. So, if you have problems understanding the shells, if you have problems figuring out how it works, if you need some sort of an explanation. This is a really, really good one. Do have a look at it. Maybe it will help you figure out your way through the consoles. All right, um, I think that's it for the articles. We are now at the releases section. As usual, it is July. There is not that much things happening. Whoops, that's the wrong button. Um, so we got some releases. There's node 10.7. Uh, the major highlight being upgrade to libuv 10.22 and ICU 62.1 and uh, the new addition of console.timelog method, which is pretty neat. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, you have this console.time method, right, which starts the timer and then you got the console time end, which um, allows you to track the time between the time start and time end. So with time log, you can actually give the label uh, of the time start and then some data to uh, log intermediary time. So sort of, you know, figure out how much time passed in between the thing so you don't have to create a lot of time uh, starts and time time ends, which you had to do before, which is quite neat. Obviously, there's some additional um, minor things, but you know, feel free to read it yourself if you want. I don't think they are. Oh, they've actually pu published the HR big uh, HR time big int into the um, main branch, which is pretty neat. So you can now use uh, big ints within the HR time method to track performance, which is also pretty cool. Right, the next uh, release we have in NPM version 6.2.0 and um, they have added the parsable output and uh, sign git commit to control the commit signing when you do the um, NPM, what was it? NPM release, I think, or there was some command that basically did the git stuff for you, which I never used to be honest, but you know, if you're using it, then you can now toggle signing, which is, I guess, pretty nice. All right, uh, the next thing we got is Hoverboard 2.0 release. So this is an announcement from Google team. Uh, Hoverboard 2 is a conference website template. If you know, uh, like you might know that Google does a lot of conferences, um, not just like 
large ones, uh, but also like smaller developer conferences, like local ones, like the GDG uh, DevFest Ukraine, for example. I believe it is Google, right? I'm not mistaken here. Wait a second. Let me just, is it a Google? I'm now confused because I somehow assumed it was Google, but I might be, no, it is not Google. Okay. I, I, no, wait, GDG summit at Google. I'm so confused right now. Is that a Google or not? Uh, at least, okay, let's put it this way. What? No, that's not what I wanted. Uh, let's put it this way. Google affiliated company or group of people released a conference website template. And uh, the whole thing is that it's a very good progressive web app that is displays just as well on desktop as it does on mobiles. And it is essentially easy to set up. It uses Jekyll and GitHub pages. It is simple and responsive, uses Bootstrap and very easy to set up the speakers and session management using YAML files and it's zero friendly. So basically everything you wanted to have for your conference, all in one easy template that you can configure with YAML and then just publish it using GitHub pages which is pretty amazing if you ask me. So if you are a person doing conferences and you needed a nice templates, then have a look at this. Seems to be pretty neat. And it also has integrations with like uh, Firebase, Firestore and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, seems pretty, pretty awesome to me. So I think if I would uh, hold a conference, this is probably what I would use to save time. Right, and the last thing we got is CanJS 5.0. Um, this is the thing that I never used, but I've heard about. So this is a web framework uh, similar to Angular or React or whatever, right? And it is quite old one. And if you look at this index, you would be immediately uh, recognize things like, um, uh, what do you call it? Oh God, I, I forgot the name of it. What was the backbone, right? This is what I want to say, backbone. So um, it's still out here. They released the version 5.0, which is now used modern modules, which is pretty neat. And you know, there's apparently people using it. So if you're using CanJS, it's probably um, exciting for you. If not, then you might want to check it out. Maybe you'll find it nice because it does use this sort of uh, um, model view controller approach and maybe you like it. So I, I still prefer React over all of that stuff. Uh, have you heard anything about PMPM? Uh, yes, I will talk about PMPM later on in this stream. <laughs> we have it in libraries and demo section, which we are now gonna go into the libraries and demo section. And the first thing we got here is tiny emus. Um, so there's this page, right? And you see, and this is like, all of this is emulators, right? So there's this Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum 188, Akron Atom, DTC, and like even some games emulated and you can actually click it and uh, you will have the full emulation in browser. Uh, you might be wondering why is this interesting? Well, because this is actually, I have no idea how Commodore works because I only had it when a kid, when I was like a very small kid and I honestly don't remember anything about it. But yeah, so all of those things are actually written in WebAssembly. And there's a GitHub repo and you can have a look yourself at how exactly they were compiled to WebAssembly and uh, yes, basically explore it. So this is, this is really awesome. This is what you get when you get WebAssembly. This is like full speed emulation not that you need that much speed on modern computers to emulate Commodore or Spectrum, but you know, <laughs> it's anyway really, really cool. All right, next thing we got is Guppy or Guppy. I'm not sure how to read it correctly. It is a friendly application manager and task runner for React JS. So for all you people complaining about having to learn shell and uh, all the difficulties about setting up React development, well, there you go. You just take this GUI up, you just uh, press a plus button, create a new project, and then you just have a really nice UI to configure everything you want, including the build, test, ejections, and all that kind of stuff. It works only for React, but I think it simplifies the, uh, or makes it very easy to get started, basically. So, you know, if you're having problems, do have a look. Or maybe you just don't like the um, command line, then this will probably replace it almost completely. Right, next thing we got is Toast UI Grid, yet another Toast UI widget uh, that is very, very um, 
feature reach, let's put it this way. And uh, yeah, so if you wanted to create an Excel in JavaScript, now you can do it with uh, Toast UI Grid, which essentially is very easy to use and has a billion features as usual as the Toast UI widgets tends to do. And uh, seems to be quite straightforward to use. So yeah, if you wanted your own Excel, have a look at this. All right, next thing we got is librmoth.js. Um, the same crazy person who re-implemented, uh, what was the previous library? I think it was like, ah, Blast.js, yes. Yeah, so he implemented the Blast in JavaScript. Now he re-implemented the whole librmoth.so, that is the R mathematical library, like statistical core that R has, in pure JavaScript. So there you go. I... <laughs> Like if you're working with that stuff, you probably know what to expect there because you know, I never, I'm not a statistics guy. I basically only know the statistics on a very high level and how to apply them. And I don't think I ever use them on such a low level as like the stuff that this library provides. But as you can see here, it's incredibly large. There is so much in here. But again, if you are working with statistics, you probably know what is this, you probably know why you need that. And uh, yes, now you can do that in JavaScript. All right, next thing we got is Vasm Boy, a Game Boy emulator written in WebAssembly. And there is a website that you can uh, use and you can actually play ROMs here right on the web, which, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Again, written WebAssembly and there's, yeah, there's a demo here. So I think it's even works on the mobile. So as long as you um, use a WebAssembly compatible browsers, which I think most of them actually support it now. It is not written uh, in Rust or anything. It's written actually in assembly scripts, which is the sort of nicer human readable WebAssembly, which is pretty neat, I think. And uh, yeah, there's like, you know, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, emulators right on the web, which, which is pretty amazing. So it's really cool. Right, next thing we got is pushbar.js, a really small JavaScript plugin without any dependencies for doing sliding drawers in JavaScript. Um, this is how it looks. This is basically all it does. You know, you can just call in drawers if you need it. It's super simple. You just include the CSS and JavaScript and then you just call it done. Very straightforward, very small, very simple. Um, the next library we have is from the same author. It's called popbox.js. Also super small, super simple model windows uh, in pure JavaScript. Maybe you needed that. Also, you know, if you're using CSS framework, you probably have your own. But yeah, again, uh, looks pretty neat. Right, next thing we got is Drext, a node list like jQuery like package for a file system for Node.js. Seems pretty neat actually, so I like the idea. The idea is that you can, uh, you have this sort of the drags selector and you can run those selectors over the file system, which would run it like over the directory and then you can do like, you know, no filters for each whatever. Same thing that you do with um, jQuery, for example, right? So if you're working a lot with files, do have a look at this library that might help you ease the pain at some points. Because yeah, using globs manually is uh, a bit annoying. All right, next thing we got is ASCII chart or ASCII chart. I'm not sure how to pronounce it probably. Is it ASCII or ASCII? I think it's ASCII, right? So it's ASCII line charts for your console apps. You can actually draw <laughs> minutes. I don't know why you would want to do that, but you know, maybe if you don't have any other options in the, you, know, you have to absolutely draw stuff or draw charts in the command line, then this is, probably what you want to do. And you can even do that in HTML for whatever reason. Um, maybe you don't want to use D3JS or maybe you want a really blocky chart, then <laughs> there you go. Oh, you can actually draw it in console. Okay, I see. I see, okay, that's, um, don't know why, still don't know why would you want to do that, but uh, you can. Okay, next thing we got is start.js, the functional task runner for Node.js. Um, it's sort of the replacement for Gulp and you know stuff like this. I don't know if anyone uses anything like this after the Webpack or Parcel anymore, but if you do have a very complex build process and you do wanna have a very controlled uh, um, tasks and run them in a controlled manner, and this is essentially the task runner that allows you to do that. Seems to be quite nice. Um, I 
Don't remember when I used anything like this last time. I typically end up using just the webback, just the rollup, just the parcel or whatever, or Next.js, you know, <laughs> even easier. You don't even have to think about it. But, uh, you know, if you're using stuff like this, do have a look. Uh, it's written in TypeScript as well. So, uh, yeah, might be your thing. Okay, next thing we got is Z, the pattern matching library for JavaScript. I really like the syntax for this one. So as you know, pattern matching is coming natively to JavaScript at some point. It's still in the stage one, I believe, maybe two. But uh, this one, uh, this library allows you to do pattern matching right now using a very nice syntax. So essentially they use the defaults uh, in the function definitions. I'm like, I, I want to read the source code at some point because I'm really curious how they made that work because you literally, you define a function with a default value and this is going to be used as the pattern matching. So it's, it looks really neat. And um, like, I obviously I would still prefer the native pattern matching, but until we have it, this looks like a really, really cool library that allows you to match just about anything. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in using pattern matching JavaScript, do have a look, seems to be pretty neat. Next thing we got is um, VASM.js fed binaries, the small experiment from Mr. J Phelps in combining WebAssembly and JavaScript into one single fed binary file. This is something that I think is really cool because uh, like the problem right now is that when you have a WebAssembly code, you have to first load it somehow using fetch, for example, right? And then you have to compile it and then you have to get the uh, module from it, then you have to execute it. And it's not always what you wanna do, right? Sometimes you wanna have one binary that will be just like combined JavaScript and WebAssembly and you pre-compile it, you package it into one nice file and then you ship it as already uh, like thing that includes everything, right? So this is an experiment in doing exactly that which is, I think, really neat uh, notion. And we're going to see how that develops. I um, have not had time yet to read that, but it looks really exciting. Uh, I mean, read the source code, obviously. All right, next thing we got is fast check, a uh, property based testing framework for JavaScript uh, written in TypeScript. So um, if you are not familiar with property based testing, there's a link to tutorial here, but essentially it's uh, exactly what it says a property based uh, testing uh, library. And uh, yeah, if you know what it is and you know if you need it or not, then, well, they, you know, I, I never, I think I never used property-based testing anywhere. Not sure why and somehow ended up doing that, but uh, yeah, I guess it's maybe not, not did not yet had a project that needed it, but uh, there you go. All right, next thing we got is V8N. Um, slightly confusing naming here. It has nothing to do with V8 engine. It's actually a JavaScript validation library that allows you to do data validation using pretty nice syntax, actually. It uh, works with just about anything, including strings, numbers, whatever you can imagine, objects and shapes and stuff like this. And uh, even has support for yeah, custom validation rules, not modifier and so on and so forth. And uh, seems to be pretty flexible and very nice. Uh, the naming is still though quite, quite confusing. At first when I thought it was like, wait, so how does it, how does it relates to V8? And then you just go scroll down and it's like, okay, there's no relation to V8 whatsoever, but it still seems to be a very nice library. Right, next thing we got is PNPM. There we go, we got to that. Um, the project has been out there for a quite long time, actually. This is an alternative to NPM and Yarn, and I think it's been out uh, way before Yarn even was even uh, conceived. And it's a fast and efficient alternative to NPM. Uh, it is I think they claim it is actually faster than yarn and NPM in most cases and way more uh, storage and uh, sort of request efficient, right? So they seem to be building like, okay, so here's the thing. I think it's cool that there are more, more alternatives, right? But I never used it. I actually started lately migrating from yarn back to NPM because the NPM six finally got the deterministic log file and it seems to be working fast enough for me at least. And I don't see any reason to drag in another package manager when we already have one bundled with Node, right? Nonetheless, if you want something that is faster, better, more efficient, it's cool that we have PNPM because, well, I mean, look at those benchmarks. It is like way faster, right? Like, okay, with the log file, it actually seems to be 
not that faster than I guess actually npm seems to be faster in this case, which which is quite interesting to be honest. But yeah, um, so if you're looking for um, another replacement that may be a bit faster, I like I never tried it, but there's a lot of people who are very happy with it, so do have a look. Maybe that's your thing. Right, next thing we got is Jasper, a flexible and powerful issue reader for GitHub. It is a um, hosted or self-hosted web app if you want it. I believe it's also available as Electron app. Oh no, it is an Electron app. Okay, sorry, apologies. I thought there was a website where you can just read it uh, online, which seems like a weird decision not to expose it as a web app, uh, but okay. So it's a desktop app that allows you to read the um, GitHub issues in sort of a email style client, I guess. I've never was involved in uh, open source projects that had that many issues. So I had problems to read them on GitHub itself. So I don't think I fall into the target group of target user group of this app, but Nonetheless, it looks pretty sleek and uh, quite nice. And, uh, you know, maybe you would need that. So do have a look. Right, next thing we got is Lepto.js, an automated image editing, optimization and analysis via command line and web interface. So um, the guys just was, you know, thinking that's like when you prepare the images for web, it's, it's quite tedious task. And there's a lot of like best practices and a lot of things that you have to optimize for, that you have to think about and so on and so forth. So it can be annoying. So they were like, okay, let's just take all the best practices, all the things you have to do with images and package them into one nice command line and web app, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And I do like that approach. So this is exactly what it is. You just have this key, we can run the setup and you can say, okay, here's the directory, here's the input, here's the output. You have to watch the files, you can watch the files, you can optimize, uh, you know, either quickly or um, for quality or so on and so forth. You can generate retina images and then you just press uh, left to run and you're done. And there's also the UI that, you know, you can tweak the same parameter essentially, but in a nicer UI uh, format with the previews, I believe. So. It seems pretty neat. So if you're working a lot with the images, this is probably something you want to have a look at. Right, next thing we got is JWebAssembly. This is actually the last uh, library we have. It is not uh, JavaScript, but it is WebAssembly. It's actually the new Java 2 WebAssembly compiler. So if you're writing in Java and if you have some Java libraries that you are using a lot and you want to compile them and use them on the web, you can now use this JWebAssembly and compile it to uh, Vasm and try to run it on the web, which uh, sounds interesting. I believe it's still experimental. So there's like expect breaking things and uh, you know, uh, things going wrong essentially, but it looks quite interesting. I would want to try to compile um, I'm not even sure if that's possible, but it would be very interesting to take the core NLP, the Stanford NLP package and compile it to WebAssembly and uh, use it on the web. Um, have you tried writing something uh, in Java? Yes, I do know Java. I work with Java quite heavily. I do not really like Java itself. I prefer to use Kotlin uh, because it allows you to do like functional programming because, you know, functional is sort of my my preferred way of coding, but Java is okay. I mean, it's a good language. Uh, but the fact that you can use like the Java has a very, because, because it's a, you know, very old established language, uh, especially in, uh, like machine learning and scientific community, like natural language processing, there's a lot of really good libraries there and being able to take them and compile them to WebAssembly and then run them within Node.js on the server, for example, I really want to try it and see how the performance will uh, compare to just running the Java server. So I'm really curious. I, I need to try that because that sounds really exciting to me at least. All right, before we wrap it up, I have some silly things. Uh, in case you do not read XKCD, there's a new software development comic that is just absolutely amazing not going to read it, you go ahead and read it yourself. There's a link in the document. Uh, it is quite hilarious. And uh, I think absolutely reflects the development process of most enterprise companies that I've worked with, at least personally. So I, I don't know, maybe there are some that are better. But man, this is just hits so much, so much close to home that is just painful. <laughs>
And uh, the next thing we got is this um, super awesome article from Motherboard. Why is Google Translate spitting out sinister religious prophecies? So uh, there's a few examples here, like if you go and set like, the Maori as the uh, source language and then just go dog, 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 dog and translate it into English, you get something like Doomsday Clock is three minutes at 12. We are expecting characters and dramatic developments in the world, which indicate that we are increasingly approaching the end times and the Jesus returns. And there's like 25 examples like this where you can just select some random language like Somali or... Um, I don't know, there's like a bunch of them here and you just enter bullshit essentially and you get like doomsday prophecies here. And the author of the article went in depth to try to figure out why exactly it happens. And well, the answer is neural networks. So apparently Google uses um, like Bible and you know, like the sacred text to uh, actually train the translations, right? Because I guess, I guess because those books are translated into a lot of languages and it's quite easy to use them as a source material. And the problem is that those neural networks can quite a kind of kind of hallucinate, right? Or be like delirious about the uh, source material. And there's like, there's an example of Google deep dream hallucinations, for example, it's quite a wide known thing, right? And uh, Essentially, if you start inputting bullshit, this is what happens. So this is sort of the downside of neural networks. And uh, I found it quite hilarious. And there's like a pretty more in-depth explanation and walkthrough on why it happens, sort of in-depth digging into that with links and everything. So I think it's just a really cool thing uh, to come out of that. Although it can be can be quite scary for people who don't understand how it works. Because I mean, come on, look, look at this text. It's just terrifying. All right, and the last thing we got is, well, it's not actually silly, it's something that I found to be absolutely fascinating. It's an article from The Guardian. Work less, uh, get more. New Zealand's firm's four-day week, an unmitigated success. Uh, success, sorry. Uh, English is hard. So there was a bunch of companies in New Zealand uh, who tried doing a four-day work, four work week, right? So instead of five days, they worked just four days a week. And they had um, other three days as essentially a long weekends every week. And uh, they tried doing that and they had a bunch of researchers who were tracking the performance of employees, performance of the companies and figuring out if, you know, if that works better, that works worse. And turns out that's actually better all across the board. So not just the employees became happier, obviously, because they had more free time, but also the... Um, performance of employees improved because apparently resting more makes you think better and makes you perform better. Who knew, right? Hey, such a novel concept. So if you're still working 24 hours a day, then maybe you want to rethink your approach to work life because, you know, having actually enough rest can uh, boost your productivity quite a lot. And especially if you're working in a creative area like software development, for, uh, for example, it is like at least from from my uh, experience, uh, one of the most productive things that you can do, especially when you have a really tough problems, is to just put everything away and not do anything for like a couple of days, not even think about it, and then just can come back to it with a empty head and you know fresh look at it, and uh, you can quite um, quite frequently have a breakthrough. It's like it is amazing what it can do and it seems like having this standardized as a four war, four day work week can lead to the same thing for all employees which is pretty amazing to be honest so um yeah i i would you know what i would be very curious to see comparison of a four day work week versus the six hour work day which is also a thing that was proven to be efficient right so it's like, I wonder what's better, working just four days a week or working five days a week but working six hours because like work time wise is more or less the same, right? You get the same amount of time work per week, but it is curious what would work better. Um, something to do with that one free day. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I, like, here's the question, right? So it's like, what would be better having just six six hours work day uh every day like every work day obviously or having just one additional free day it's like maybe it comes down to the 
uh, personal thing, but I don't know. I don't know what would work better for me. Uh, pfft, let me try, let me try that again. I don't know what would what would work better for me, right? Because I I don't have this thing when I you know if if I just want to work on something, I would go and do it like even if it's 10 p.m. or something because it means it's like ah there's this thing and I want to do it right now until I forget about that. <laughs> so I don't know if it would work for me, but uh, it is a very interesting question. Spanish people just go to sleep after 4 p.m. Uh, I mean, come on, Spanish people are so hot in Spain that I would also go to sleep when it's like that hot. I would just die there, <laughs> probably. I mean, we have like plus 30 here and I'm already dying. So it's like, yeah. Okay, um, that's basically it from my side. Do you guys have anything else you want to discuss? Maybe some links that I missed, uh, maybe something else. Uh, questions that you have to ask me, I'm going to be more than happy to answer. Uh, before we wrap up, let me say that you can find this link in the description for the Twitch channel if you're watching it live on Twitch. You can find the link to it in the description for the YouTube video if you're watching this on YouTube. As usual, uh, feel free to send me your own personal project. We'll be more than happy to highlight them. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for your support as usual. Let me have a look at the chat. When you started to code and what was your first programming languages? Um, I started to program when I was... Uh, seven years old I think it was like 1990 something 1995 so I was seven years old exactly I watched the movie hackers which was you know this uh, super silly yeah 1995 exactly super silly movie with Angelina Jolie and a lot of very like it, it was it's I mean from 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 software development perspective the movie is absolute garbage but it inspired me so much that I was like, damn, I want to be a hacker. So I started building websites in Adobe Flash, which was abysmal. I had a, my, my first uh, website was a collection of links to the hacking articles on the web, essentially. It was uh, Adobe Flash, so ActionScript 3 at a time. No, ActionScript 2 at a time. It was still 2. HTML and uh, CSS, right? It was very ugly, very basic, but you know, <laughs> building websites. And uh, yes, after that I switched to, so I tried WebAssembly, I tried like reverse engineering and uh, the ice debugger, you know, trying the cracking software, did a bit of that and then moved into, uh, so I don't, I don't know why it didn't stick with me. So the, the whole hacking thing, like I found the, uh, hacking the web servers to be fascinating, but on the other hand, for some reason, cracking software was never that exciting to me. And then for some reason, I just switched from hacking into actually building things. I don't remember how that happened, but I just, you know, started doing uh, C, C++ first, then I went from C to Java, and then I went to PHP. And then from PHP, I came to Node.js, and uh, in parallel, I was doing like C Sharp for mobile development, and then Objective C for iOS, and then Java for Android, and uh, Golang for servers, like when we had like bottlenecks with uh, Java and uh, Node.js, and like that. Yeah, something like this, basically. Any other questions or uh, links that I might have missed during this week or other things that you guys want to discuss? We'll be more than happy to talk about that. Yeah, thank you for asking. I mean, more than happy to talk about my, uh, you know, the my experience, essentially. Maybe that helps people push forward because I am essentially a self-taught developer. You know, I, I even though I did my PhD in computer science. My diploma is actually in uh, like the, the master thesis is in electrical engineering. I'm theoretically an engineer. So, so you know, I'm kind of, kind of, yeah, partially self-taught, let's put it this way. <laughs> All right, so um, if you don't have any more questions, I guess let's just wrap it up here. There was BXS Weekly episode 20. Uh, Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your support. And uh, yes, do send me your stuff. Let me just open the phone because I don't want to click all those things on a desktop. I do like my Streamlabs remote control thingy. It's pretty neat. Right. Thank you for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend. Do send me your things. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your support. And I see you next time. Bye.